In January of 1984, political scientist Josh Rosenberg founded the main Green Independent Party, the first Green political movement in the United States. This brought up the question of whether or not this Green movement should go nationwide, and two meetings of the North American Bioregional Congress met in May of that year to later in August. The Green Committees of Correspondence 60 met to discuss the 10 key values and the formation of a national party. Two years later, the National Green Gathering was held at Hampshire College in Hamhurst, Massachusetts, and it was entitled Building the Green Movement, a National Conference for New Politics, with Josh Rosenberg, Howie Hawkins, activist and future perennial candidate for multiple New York offices. Later, in 1988, a meeting called Greening of the West was held in California, which was the nucleus for creating the Green Party of California 15 months later. And finally, in June of 1989, the second Green National Gathering was held in Eugene, Oregon, to finalize and the concerns to the need for a national party, and two years later, we got one. In August of 1991, a Green Gathering in Elkins, West Virginia was held which led to the creation of the first National Green Party called Green Slash Green Party USA was formed. Charles Betts, G Slash GP USA Coordinating Committee Commander, Howie Hawkins, Johnny Whitmore, Chair of the Green Party of Alaska, as well as Hilda Mason of the DC Statehood Green Party held a conference to formally announce the party. Later, they filed paperwork to become a 527 group and an officially or recognized political party by the FEC. The party did not do much and is mostly focused on local organization. Yes, I said is, since it is still around, and it remained the dominant Green Party in the U.S. during the first presidential election that they participated in. While the Green slash Green Party USA did not officially endorse him, many state Green Parties drafted consumer advocate and political activist Ralph Nader. Nader had a handful of running mates across the individual states, but the most prominent one of them, being American environmentalist, economist, and writer Winona LaDuke. Nader, however, received some criticism as he rarely discussed social issues, and when he did, it wasn't too kind, even calling gay rights, quote, gonadal politics. Now, Nader is a supporter of gay rights, and those comments were more likely made due to Nader wanting to focus more on environmental and economic issues, adding the fact that both major parties were using social issues to divide floaters rather than fixing the other issues. But anywho, Nader was on the ballot in 21 states and was a writing candidate in 24 more. And by the end, Nader managed to acclaim 0.71% of the popular vote, placing fourth behind Bill Clinton, Bob Dole, and Ross Perot. Not too bad for a person who wasn't even running on the national level. Afterwards, the state parties actually decided to unite and form the Association of State Green Parties. And although Nader did not campaign as actively as other candidates, four years later, that would completely change. Ralph Nader cited the inability to get his views of his public interest groups heard by the Clinton administration as a major factor for him deciding in 2000 he would actively seek the nomination of the ASGP. He did, however, have some challengers, but none of them were really too significant to the race itself. They were author and scholar Joel Covell, self-proclaimed hippie Stephen Gaskin, and Eric Reed Boucher, better known as Jello Biafra, lead singer of the Dead Kennedys. Nader obviously won the nomination, and when Noel Duke was chosen again to be his running mate, Nader's campaign called attention to problems with the two-party system, voter fraud, environmental justice, universal health care, affordable housing, free education, including college, workers' rights, campaign finance reform, and increasing the minimum wage to a living wage. He also focused on the three strikes rule, exoneration for prisoners for drug-related nonviolent crimes, legalization of commercial hemp, and a shift in tax policies to place the burden more heavily on corporations than on the middle and lower class. He imposed pollution credits as giveaways of publicly owned assets. Nader and his supporters felt that Al Gore and the Democratic Party had shifted too far to the right, and said that he would not be remorseful if Al Gore lost the election, being quoted as saying, Al Gore thinks that we're supposed to be helping him get elected. I've got news for Al Gore. If we can't beat the bumbling Texas governor with that terrible record, he ought to go back to Tennessee. Nader held super rallies that drew over 10,000 members and rallied much support over the course of the election, including endorsements from prominent atheist thinker Christopher Hitchens, filmmaker Michael Moore, and Citizens Party candidate in 1980, Barry Commoner. Nader managed to get on the ballot in 43 states as well as D.C. with Reddit access and four more. He even managed to get 664,151 in federal matching funds. Not as much as the Gore and Bush campaigns, but a good amount for a third party. And by the end of the election, 
he managed to acquire 2.74% of the popular vote. But uh-oh, we got some controversy. Florida. The election results were called for Gore early on in the election, but later the state was called for Bush. The results were too close to count. This inevitably led to a proposed recount and a canceling of said recount with a 7-2 decision in Bush v. Gore. But many people took a look at the results of Florida and saw how Ralph got 97,488 votes in Florida. Votes that if they had all voted for Gore, Gore would have, Gore would have gotten 3,009,741 votes. Thus leading to the conclusion that Ralph Nader had spoiled the election for Al Gore. Now the validity of the spoiler myth is highly debated amongst political scientists and I'll be making a more in-depth video later on the idea of the spoiler myth. For a more in-depth look at Ralph Nader's case in particular, check out Mr. Beat's video here. But to summarize it, the major issues of why Ralph Nader more than likely wasn't a spoiler was Gore didn't run as good of a campaign as he thought. Gore lost many of the main demographics in Florida to Bush, Florida Democrats, and Florida women. Nader's voters stated that they might have stayed home if the, Nader had not been in the election. The spoiler myth took the blame away from the Democrats and how they ran the campaign, and the Supreme Court case and our faulty voting system in general were the true factors in Bush's win. Now, despite the blame game, the ASGP moved forward, even opting to formally change its name to the less confusing Green Party of the United States, or just the Green Party, and they had moved forward with their electoral ambitions. The election of 2004 was seen as kind of a recall election. George W. Bush pushed into a war that really, really didn't have any reason to be in and curbed civil liberties, and environmentalism was a rising issue. As per usual, the Green Party did another primary season to find a candidate. They were environmental activist, writer, and lecturer Lorna Salzman, inspector at the Air Pollution Control District of San Diego County, Dr. Kent Mesplay, community organizer Paul Glover, and American attorney and political activist David Cobb, Wait a minute, where's Ralph Nader? Well, Nader decided to run an independent campaign with 1976 Socialist Workers Party presidential candidate Peter Kameho as his running mate. Although they would have accepted an endorsement from the Green Party, with both Nader and Kameho being alternative ballot options, to add more salt to the wound, Ohio Representative Dennis Kucinich was running for the Democratic Party's nomination, and many Greens indicated that they would not run a candidate if he received the nomination. He, of course, didn't. But that didn't stop people from voting for him in the Green Party National Convention. I mean, that also didn't stop people from voting for Eugene V. Debs. After two ballots, David Cobb won and Pat LaMarche was selected as his running mate. Cobb managed to get on the ballot in 28 states and much like the 2000 election, Cobb spent a majority of his time trying to get into the major party debates, even being arrested alongside the Libertarian Party candidate Michael Badnerick for protesting with the inclusion of the major party debates. By November, Cobb had managed to get 0.10% of the popular vote, placing 6th place overall. Two thousand and eight was the year for change, and the Green Party wanted to be that change, and as such, many campaigned to be the candidate of change. However, the only ones that I will mention are Jesse Johnson, former chairman of the Mountain Slash West Virginia Green Party, Cat Swift, former chair of the Green Party of Texas, Dr. Kent Mesplay, making a comeback from two thousand four, and Cynthia McKinney, a six term Democratic congressman from Georgia. Oh, and Ralph Nader, despite the fact that he was again running as an independent. McKinney easily became the nominee and soon nominated Rosa Clement a community organizer, independent journalist, and hip-hop activist from New York as a running mate. She received prominent endorsements from actress Roseanne Barr, philosopher Noam Chomsky, and former congressman and 2008 candidate for the Republicans, Ron Paul. McKinney participated in many left-wing rallies, including one at the 2008 Democratic National Convention organized by Recreate 68, which was an effort to, quote, make the 1968 Democratic National Convention protests look small in comparison. McKinney received a lot of praise for being a progressive alternative to Barack Obama, but also received criticism for claiming that during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the Pentagon dumped 5,000 executed felons that were killed by a single bullet to the head. Despite this, she managed to get 5,148 federal matching funds and 0.12% of the popular vote, gaining more votes than Cobb, but still getting 6th place overall. Obama was criticized by progressives for not bringing the change that he promised, and by conservatives for being too far left. Okay, now most progressives would have either sucked it up and voted for Obama or voted for Ralph Nader, but Nader chose not to participate in this election, so the Green Party decided to capitalize on this and tried to appeal to many of Nader's previous voters. The five major candidates that tried to get the nomination were Stuart Alexander, the Socialist Party USA candidate for VP in 2008, who was also running for the nominations of the Peace and Freedom Party and the Socialist Party, 
Though he dropped out early in the Green Party primary and became the nominee purely of the Socialist Party, Harley Mickelson, candidate for Michigan's 5th Congressional District, Dr. Kent Nesplay, making another run for the presidency, comedian and actress Roseanne Barr, and lastly, Lexington Town Meeting member and two-time Massachusetts gubernatorial candidate Dr. Jill Stein. Now, I've done a video in the past about Roseanne's campaign, so go check it out for more details. All you need to know is that Jill Stein won the nomination, and although many individuals called for Barr to be Stein's running mate, Stein chose political activist Cherry Hankala instead. Stein's campaign called for a Green New Deal, a stimulus package that aims to aid the financial crises and environmental issues such as climate change in the vein of FDR's New Deal programs. Stein was on the ballot in 36 states and D.C., and even managed to get $260,389 in federal matching funds. In the height of the Democratic National Convention, the Stein campaign aired its first campaign ad titled Enough. Google TV attempted to block the ad from airing, claiming that the ad's obscenity violated TV indecency rules due to Jill Stein saying a censored instance of the word. Bullshit. Stein made many media appearances bringing up the argument that the third party candidates need to be included in the major party debates. Stein and Hankala even got arrested for disorderly conduct by attempting to participate in the second major party debate. The two women claimed that they were taken to a warehouse and strapped to chairs for eight hours, and although she doesn't participate in the major party debates, she participated in a handful of third party debates with Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party, Virgil Good of the Constitution Party, and Rocky Anderson of the Justice Party. Stein eventually amassed 0.36% of the popular vote. Twenty sixteen was an interesting year for US politics. Establishment candidates from both parties were running against populist candidates from both parties. Senator Bernie Sanders was the ideal candidate for the Green Party due to his progressive slash social democratic platform. However, Sanders chose to run as a Democrat as he was very pragmatic and knew that it was a long shot either way, so he might as well start off with somewhat fair footing. Meanwhile, the Green Party went ahead with their primaries. Their candidates were Kent Mesplay, making another run for the office, Daryl Cherney, organizer for the environmental rights group Earth First, Elijah Manley, Black Lives Matter activist and chapter president of the National Youth Rights Association, Sadinam Kinamo Kristen Moyo Wasiza Curry, an organizer for the People's National Convention, a political party from Ghana, William Krelm, a distinguished professor from the University of South Carolina, and of course, Dr. Jill Stein herself. During the campaign, Stein, Mesplay, and Curry were invited to a debate on RT America. Jill Stein, of course, won the nomination. She had a lot of choices for her running mate. Her short list was former chair of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, Kevin Zeese, former pediatrician and U.S. senatorial candidate, Dr. Margaret Flowers, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author, Chris Hedges, former chair of the Seattle Black Panther Party, Aaron Dixon, former Ohio State Senator and surrogate to the Sanders campaign, Nina Turner, and human rights advocate, Ajamu Baraka. Baraka was eventually chosen to be her running mate, after the Democratic Convention, the Stein campaign urged many disgruntled Bernie Bros, even Sanders himself, to support the Green Party. Sanders said no, since he viewed the Democratic nominee to be the only pragmatic way to defeat Donald Trump from becoming president. Now, personally, I feel if Sanders endorsed Stein or even ran for the Green Party nomination himself, all of his base would have voted for him in droves, but that's just me. Prominent Bernie Bros, such as former Asheville City Council members Cecil Bothwell and political commentators such as Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske chose to endorse Jill Stein rather than Hillary Clinton leading to many people starting the political slogan slash hashtag, Jill not Hill. Jill managed to get on the ballot in 45 states, though she was a writing candidate in three of those states. Stein and Johnson were both praised and criticized by individuals in the media, respectively. The media paid them some attention with CNN and John Stossel hosting town halls with both of the candidates at respective periods of time. Stein was attacked more viciously than Johnson, because many saw her as a spoiler trying to ruin Hillary's chances by appealing to Sanders supporters, a la Ralph Nader even accusing her of being a 9-11 truther and claiming that she said vaccines cause autism. John Oliver even brought up that she recorded a bad hippie song during her time in the band, Checkmate Green Party. Despite these claims, many people voted their conscience on election day as Jill Stein managed to get 1.07% of the popular vote, more than the previous three tickets combined. Is that it for Stein and the Green Party? No, because Stein called for a recount in the three Rust Belt states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, all three which coincidentally voted for Donald Trump. And Reform and American Delta Party candidate Rocky Del Fuente also called for a recount in Nevada. However, Stein's recounts were halted in Michigan and Pennsylvania, and in Wisconsin, the recount proved ineffective. But uh-oh, we got more controversy, because on December 18th, 2017, the Washington Post reported that Senate Intelligence Committee was investigating Jill Stein's campaign for collusion with Russia, despite the lack of evidence that tied the two together. 
politicians accusing central left politicians for working with Russia. Doesn't this sound familiar to anybody? So anyways, aside from runs for office outside of the White House, post-election endorsements, and a hint of presidential ambitions by former governor of Minnesota Jesse the Body Ventura, we've reached the most recent developments of the Green Party. So to all of you pot-smoking, eco-socialist, tree-hugging hippies, hope you win a position in government in the near future. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to be notified if a future video mic comes out. What are your thoughts on the Green Party? Leave your thoughts on the Green Party in the comment section below. And or, if you have another political party that you would like a full video on, please let me know.